what I'm what I'm having a weird time wrapping my head around is the idea that like all the BUI or I voting while intoxicated and things like that. I did not think of San Francisco Bay as a party boat uh, place. You know what really happened a lot was um, you get back like in the estuaries, you know, there's a lot of flotillas. You get up in the Delta and they have big, you know, deals like that. Um, at that time, you know, like I said, in, in 9-11 changed a lot of everything, I mean, not just in the military world, but in how we responded. But, you know, we would get a lot of, I hate to say it, but just kind of derelict people or people who are struggling or, you know, dealing and problems and you know and they, they could very cheaply live on a boat in san francisco but they you know would anchor up in places where they're not supposed to retire off the piers where they're not supposed to and you know and they would cook meth or steal copper cable off of things you know so we would run into kind of it was actually for san francisco i think the population at the time was around seven hundred thousand. And it was interesting to see how many of the same players we would see. Like, oh man, I've been we've been dealing with this guy, you know, because there is largely, I mean, San Francisco is, is a very upscale place and um, big sailboat community. Um, but you also have a lot of large ships that either transit into um, you know, the Oakland area, you know, like all those container yards, or go all the way up the Delta. Um, to like Sacramento, and that's oh, a port of entry. I didn't realize Sacramento was connected. I guess I guess I did, but I just didn't click that you guys could get to Sacramento on, by water from San Francisco. It's a long ways up there. So let's jump to you're in for a year and a half, give or take two years, and 9-11 happens. How much did that change you? You know, quite a bit. Um, because I had just transferred to uh, Coast Guard Cutter Kukui as a uh, home ported in, at the time, it's moved since, but it was home ported in uh, Sand Island in Honolulu, Hawaii. And I had orders to Navy dive school. So I went directly to Kukui, got underway, and we went to Midway Island. And we were working AIDS navigation, doing like fisheries, law enforcement, net recovery, uh, derelict fishing net recovery type stuff. And I flew out of Midway back to Honolulu and went to um, Navy dive school there at uh, Ford Island. They had a satellite scuba school that was for like, the submariners and uh, the buoy tender guys, you know, and, and did the eight week scuba course there. And just after that, 9-11 happened, and it, it really just changed everything. That The job on Kukui was awesome because we would just go far reaches of the Pacific, Marianas Island, I mean, Christmas Island, we'd go everywhere, you know, and it would take, I mean, some of the aids navigation would work for, you know, 12-day, 15-day transits, just a one buoy, and so, I mean, that's a right there just there and back. So now you throw work in a whole island or harbor on top of it, then you do a mission, you know, easily get 70, 90 days of, you know, trips in these beautiful parts of the world that not easily get to. But anyway, 9-11 happened and they, uh, it's really bizarre. Hawaii was kind of a laid back place, but all the ships, they didn't really have enough ammo to qualify the number of people on weapons to do shore patrols, you know, and, and respond to the um, security threat levels. And so they pulled, like there were, there were maybe like five or six guys on uh, Kikui that were fully qualified weapons and everything like that. And they pulled us right off the ship and basically it's like World War II type stuff, formed a, you know, a shore patrol, shore party. And, um, and so we would do, Luke and I did the uh, midnight to 8 a.m. watch. So we literally would drive around Sand Island in a Cushman, you know, smoking camel lights and patrolling, looking for, uh, you know, looking for, for terrorists, you know, and um, it was really bizarre. And then they, uh, once the powers to be got all the, you know, the patrols and, and force protection things ready, we got underway and just patrolled um, the south shore of Oahu 
Man, it was something like in four months, we did a year's worth of underway hours of what would traditionally would have been operational hours. Um, and it was just patrolling the Tesoro mooring, they have an offshore um, fuel mooring. And we patrolled that just round the clock. I mean, you could get up on the uh, on the big eyes on the top of the cutter, and you could literally look up to Red Hill, where most of us lived in the Army housing, IA housing, and you could see your house. And we were like, you know, four months. We would pull in for fuel and food and got back out there and patrolled. Same thing, like, you know, we had the ship out, small boats out. Um, it was a very heavy response. And then um, one of the, there were three buoy tenders out in that district, two were in Honolulu, one was in Guam, and the one in Guam was a really old one. It wasn't one of the new modern buoy tenders, and they were having, uh, they had a diesel electric uh, motor generator configuration, and they were having problems with that. So we actually went out there to cover um, their AOR in Guam, and I don't remember how long we were there, but it was for a while. It was, to give you the timeline, 9-11 took us there, but then there was the SARS pandemic. Oh, that, that's that, right. The, yeah, that the original and, I don't remember SARS. The year. And then, um, and so we were out there actually boarding foreign fishing boats looking for evidence of SARS to not let it into Guam which was crazy as I think about it, you know, going on, you know, unmasked and, you know, going on there with, the, you know, a laminated sheet of all these different dialects, basically like, hey, are you sick? You know, and there's, I mean, I don't know if you've ever been on a foreign fishing boat, but the conditions are pretty terrible. They're probably, they probably are resistant to SARS. <laughs> yeah, the, their immune systems are always stronger than ours. Yeah. Definitely. So you said that you flew out of um, Midway to go back to... <laughs> Hawaii did get your to do your dive school. So did you were you able to finish that, or did they pull you back to the ship? Oh no, I, I finished dive school. Um, okay. I mean, I but, can't remember. Go, go go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just gonna say. So when they flew you out, you were you went and for the next eight weeks you did your dive school. Yep, and then uh, yeah, one of my good friends on that ship, actually the best man at his wedding, he was really pissed because I I came there with orders to dive school and he'd been on the ship for a while before and so i showed up i was, a, I was still a uh what, what you call like a e4 select or whatever i was an e3 but i'd already uh, struck bosun's mate so um i was a te technically an fn bm which doesn't really exist it normally would be a, a seaman bosun's mate but i was part of the engineering department and originally it struck mk but I didn't want to stay there. And so I wanted dive school. So anyway, just the way it worked out is I said, Hey, if you want to go to dive school, you need to be a bosun's mate. I was like, fine, bosun's mate, sign me up. And um tired of fixing engines, I'd rather break them, kind of thing, you know. And <laughs> and that's so um the uh anyway, I show up and so I got there maybe a few days before May 1st. I think I got there like April 25th. I show up and then May 1st get my crows become beam three and then you know within i think it was June. okay anyway it's just a very short time after i got leave to dive school and so using my buddy paul's and he's like what the hell he's like this guy just shows up and he gets all these accolades and i'm like no 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 i worked my ass off to get here it just got executed you know in front of you so anyway he was going to the dive school right after mine and he was in dive school during 9-11 and they did, they stopped it. So he had to come back to the ship and wait a little bit to go back and, and finish his order. So I was very fortunate to be on the front side of all that because the calls were there. So I was able to just respond and do what I needed to do. So um, just to put it into perspective, I kind of know how big a cutter is. Um, definitely smaller than a destroyer. How big was your cutter? I mean, because you're talking about going from Hawaii to Midway, which is what a couple a week at sea. Oh yeah, it's a, I think it's seven seven to ten days. Um, and we it's I don't know if you went straight because we would actually stop and there's all these little 
research stations where people are sitting on spits of land, you know, looking at monk seals and counting turtles. And we would stop and refuel them and resupply them or deliver people. But, but yeah, to answer your question, it's a 225 foot ocean going buoy tender, weighs about 2,000 long tons and has a big crane that can pick up about 50,000 pounds. And the crew of, I want to say the crew is like, 38 or 40. Oh, okay. Um, wow, it's real small then. Real small. Yeah, so it's a lot of work. Um, I mean, you go in like literally, you know, I could be out diving all day or driving the small boat as a cox and come right back and then have to go up on watch as either, a, you know, I think at the time they called quartermaster of the watch um, or deck watch officer um you know and then go do boardings then go work buoys so it was i have one of my favorite pictures on that ship someone took like an actual like a 35 millimeter picture um we were down in Kwajalein, and i mean just working our asses off i mean 140 degrees on the buoy deck your boots are like melting on the deck and and covered in just like black and buoy grime and everything and I'm just laying face down on my uh, PFD, my life jacket, and it's all grimy. And I'm just like laying there and just look disgusting. And I was like, man, to, to go back to a time when you worked that hard, you just physically exhausted. Um, I, I think those are some of the best night sleeps I ever had. You know? Oh, yeah. I can tell you I some of the best night sleeps I've ever had were, was when I was deployed to Iraq. No. Uh, I, it's something about the op tempo, I think, that just gives you some comfort or however you want to put that. So um, did you guys basically did some island hopping. I mean, mm -hmm. you're talking about Kwajalein, Midway. Um, yeah. French Forget Shoals, Roy Namor. Um, God, islands that don't even have names. The whole Hawaiian chain out to Midway. Um, Marjoro. Um, oh, dude, I... I I wish, you know, back uh, then they, we didn't have our cell phones with cameras, but there's beaches where I've landed a small boat on, you know, uh, we're setting up whatever, a, a, a deployable GPS system or something like that, just so the ship can position its navigation and landing on a beach. And it looks like a Corona beach. I mean, the watercolor, there's not a footprint in sight, you know, there's coconut crabs ripping open coconuts and um, you know, a little shark swimming in the lagoon or goonie bird. I mean, it's just really, really amazing. I, I loved it. Um, actually, I thought I might have a picture. I don't know, I don't know where all the stuff is, but uh, it, uh, yeah, it was, it was a really, really great experience. Um, and I loved how far out we could get with lack of supervision. You know, I, I would do some of these flyaway missions just a few other people or just a dive team and we wouldn't have a radio guard you know we wouldn't have we'd have a satellite phone to call if we got in trouble like, don't call it's too expensive <laughs> 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 and um and we would literally you know be like hey a c-130 is going to come through here in two weeks and it'll be here and i mean it was it was really I, just thinking about it now, and especially having been in command and program manager and things like that, it would have been nuts to let a bunch of hooligans go do the Lord's work on these islands, you know, and, and without any kind of oversight. But that was also the beautiful thing about the Coast Guard is they empower their junior enlisted with tremendous responsibility and tremendous authority and 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 trust them to do the right thing and for the large part they do um but i saw that change a lot over time too you know they when they started kind of restructuring um just with oversight and authority you know they wanted to pull the decisions to a higher level as opposed to referring to um, on-scene initiative you know and try to make a decision from behind a radio in a, in a you know, a watch center and you just, it just doesn't work as well. You know, it's nice to have the, you know, an idea come in, but only you can see what needs to be done in the midst right. of fury. So now on the personal side, uh, do you sound like you've got out of boot camp and went to two of the best duty stations possible at San Francisco and Hawaii? Um, how was Very San fortunate. Francisco for you? 
off duty? You know, it was okay. Um, I was young. I was under 21. Um, so, you know, I, I, the only reason I say that is that it was, it was hard to get out and like go places. Um, I would, I would live there for about eight months and then I got married. So my wife and I moved into housing in Alameda, but I spent that, that unit required a lot of work. You would work, um, two days on two days off and then slide a weekend. And then you would have a, a, a five day work week, you know, where you show up from, you know, like 5:45 till 4:45 or something like that. Um, I surfed a lot there. Um, and, um, you know, but didn't really, I mean, I we toured the city a little bit, but I mean, you're talking about being a E2, E3 in San yeah. Francisco. I mean, my paychecks were like $250 a month, you know, and, you know, and the housing allowance would have been astronomical, but even with the housing allowance, you were still paying. You couldn't for, afford yeah. anything. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. so it was very poor. So I made the most, I bought a surfboard and bought a Jeep. Um, my wife worked and yeah, I, I worked a lot there. I mean, that's just it, but it was fun work. It was always exciting. With the, um, with the, San, with the San Francisco side. So you, you guys were housed in Alameda. So was it, were you guys ported on the Alameda side? Cause I mean, that's like a whole nother world compared to the San Francisco side. Yep. So there were different housing options available. One of them was up North in Novato. Um, so when I first got there, I actually lived in barracks on Yerba Buena Island. And I don't know if they still have those barracks. I know the buildings are there, but I don't know if they use them as barracks. Um, and honestly, that was the way that I got qualified so quickly is even when I wasn't on duty, if the search and rescue alarm went off, I would just grab my shit and go, it, you know, and like just jump on a boat, you know, they're very rarely would be like, no, stay behind. You know, they're always take somebody willing to work. I mean, he wants to fish dead bodies out of the water, you know, apparently, you for that. apparently I do. Um, <laughs> no, but I, I just liked it, I've just have always been a goer and doer, you know, like I've been back here today and all I've done is slept and I'm already feeling bored, but I needed rest, you know, and, and been gone the last couple of weeks and doing, 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 but anyway, um, yeah, no, they switched to, um, they had really old housing there. It's now condemned. You can't even actually drive back to it. Um, they're in Alameda, but Alameda wasn't so bad. We, um, there were like cool little restaurants, and things like that. The getting through the the traffic at the Bay Bridge though was horrible. I mean, oh yeah, I, yeah. The it, San Francisco traffic's just insane. I, mm -hmm. They've taught me bitch about LA. I mean, that's where I grew up, and San Francisco is a whole different level of torment, for lack of a better word. Yeah, yeah. Our Liberty expired really early. I mean, I would leave for work, you know, four four thirty. And I mean, we were out there 5.30, 5.45 for PT, because any time after that, I mean, it'd take you two hours to get through that traffic. And so, so then when you guys went over to Hawaii, did, were you finally able to, I mean, obviously the first few months of you guys in Hawaii, it sounds like you didn't see much of your home anyways. You know, I, I was gone a lot. I, you know, my first wife and I are not um, married anymore. Um, and the I was just, I was in Coast Guard just under 16 years, just about a week shy of 16 years. Uh, no, about a month and a week shy of 16 years. And um, 13 of those were at sea or deployed. And so, in Hawaii, we were there from uh, I was there from April 01 to May 05, I believe. Yeah, May May 2005. I was not home a lot. The only time we were home was dry dock. Um, and we would have, you know, import maintenance periods. But a lot of times if the ship was in a maintenance period and an aid to navigation would go off station, we, as divers, we would take truck and trailer, fly out and go actually do work on other islands, you know? And so we could work independent of the ship. We had the positioning equipment, lift bags, you know, everything we needed to actually work aids and navigation both on in the water and on shore so we would do a lot of that even while the ship was in port um, so will you explain what an aid to navigation is 
Uh, yeah, so you've got floating ace navigation, which are buoys, you know, and they can range in all sizes from freaking enormous to, you know, little temporarily unlit, you know, things that you can drag around by hand. Um, you've got fixed aids navigation, which could be everything from lighthouses to, you know, um, unlit day boards. You know, they just mark channels, um, you know, entries to ports. Um, sometimes they're turning lights on shore, you know, like you're marking the, like a lighthouse, you know, you're marking the point of land, uh, the, the identify hazards navigation. And um, yeah, it's a, it's a big job. It's a huge responsibility. I mean, you think about the value of cargo coming in on ships and as the Coast Guard, they advertised, hey, these aids navigation are going to be you know, within a certain range of accuracy of where they're advertised. And if it's not, there's a big question of liability, you know? And so when an ace navigation is either struck, moved or missing, you either have to go replace it or put it back in, you know, in its position or rebuild it just depending on what it is. And I was on, uh, I did two buoy tenders and a construction tender. Um, and when I was in Hawaii, I actually shattered my leg and did some recovery um, at the AIDS navigation team. And that was their job is to just fly to every island and work every point of land. So that was actually a really good place for me to recover because um, the officer in charge was great to work with. He made, he's actually um, kind of helped steer me out of being the grunt, doing all the work and work course into like doing some more of the administrative work and you know, the, the things that have to happen, like submitting those reports that say, you know, where the aids are, um, you know, doing the logistics of travel and things like that, which which I really needed because it was, you know, I, I was very avoidant of doing the paperwork um, just because you were too busy or whatever. But the irony was when I went to headquarters as a program manager and trying to quantify all the work that divers had done since the 1940s, you know, if you fast forward to, you know, the 2000s when I'm actually finding reports that I submitted and they were the biggest pieces of crap. They didn't tell anything. They didn't say, you know, like, like, I know we did a good job. I know how hard the work was, but it didn't, you know, the bean counters up didn't there value, yeah. behind the curtain, there's no value in it. And so that's why I was like, oh, dude, I'm part of the problem.